I was imagining th uh, three servers um, with logs that looked like this, where the numbers I'm writing are the term numbers of the command that's in that log entry. So we don't really care what the actual commands are. Um, and I'm gonna number the log slots. Um, um, and so um, let's imagine that the, uh, um, presumably the, the next term is term six, although you can't actually tell that from looking at the evidence on the board, but it must be at least six or greater. Um, let's imagine that server S3 is chosen as the leader uh, for term six. And at some point, um, S3, the new leader, is gonna wanna send out a new log entry. So let's suppose it wants to send out its first log entry for term six. So we're sort of thinking about the append entries, RPCs, that the leader's gonna send out to carry um, the first log entry for term six. So they should be under slot 13. Um, the rules in figure two say that an append entry RPC actually has two, as well as the command that um, the client sent into the leader that we wanna replicate on in the logs of all the uh, followers. There's this append entries RPC also contains this previous um, log index field and a previous log term field. Um, and when we're sending out an end, uh, append entries for where this is the first entry, we're the leader's supposed to um, put information about the previous slot, the slot before the um, new information it's sending out. So in this case, uh, the log index of the previous entry is uh, 12, um, and the term of the command in the leader's log for the previous entry is five. Uh, so it sends out this information to the followers. Um, and the followers, before they accept uh, append entries, are supposed to check. You know, they know they've received an append entries that um, for some log entries that start here. Um, and the first thing they do is check that their previous, the receiving followers check that their previous log entry um, matches the previous information that the, follow, that the leader sent out. Um, so for server two, of course, it doesn't match. The, um, server two has an has a entry here, all right, but it's an entry from term four, not from term five. Um, and so the server two is gonna reject this append entries and sort of send a false reply back to the leader. Um, and server one doesn't even have anything here, so server one's gonna also reject the append entries from the leader. Um, and so, so far, so good, right? The terrible thing that, that has been averted at this point is um, you know, the bad thing we, we absolutely don't wanna see is that server two actually stuck the new log entry in here, um, which would break the sort of um, uh, inductive proofs, essentially, that the uh, figure two scheme relies on. Um, and hide the fact that uh, server two actually had a different log. So instead of accepting the log entry, server two rejects this RPC. Um, the leader sees these two rejections, and the leader is maintaining this next index field, one for each follower. Um, so it has a next index um, for server two, and the leader has a next index for um, server one. Um, presumably, if the, I should have said this before, if the server's sending out information about uh, slot 13 here, that must mean that the server's next indexes for both of these um, other servers is started out as 13. And that would be the case if the server, if this leader had just restarted, because the figure two rules say that next index starts out at the end of the new leader's log. Um, and so in response to errors, the leader's supposed to decrement its next index field. So it does that for both, got errors from both. Um, decrements to 12 and resends. And this time the server's gonna send out uh, append entries with uh, previous log index equals 11, um, and previous log term equals three. And this new append entries uh, has, a, has a different previous log index, but it's the content in the, the log entries that the um, server's gonna send out this time include um, 
you know, all the entries after the, the new previous log index is sending out. So server two now, the previous log index 11, um, it looks there and it sees a high, you know, the term is three, same as what the leader is sending me. So server two is actually gonna accept this append entries and uh, figure two rules say, oh, if you accept a append entries, you're supposed to delete everything in your log after where the append entry starts and replace it with whatever's in the append entries. So server two is gonna do that. Now it's, um, he just logged to five, six. Server one still has a problem because it has nothing at slot 11. Um, it would return another error. Uh, the server will now back up um, its server one next index to 11. Um, it'll send out its log starting here with the previous uh, index and term referring now to this slot. And this one's actually acceptable to server one. Um, it'll adopt, it'll accept the new log entries and send a positive response back to the server. And now they're all, um, now they're all caught up. Um, and the, um, presumably the server also when it sees the, that uh, the followers accepted an append entries that had a certain number of log entries, it actually increments this next index um, to be 14 for both of them. All right, so the net effect of all this backing up is that the server has um, used the backup mechanism to um, detect the point at which the followers' logs started to be equal to the servers and then sent each of the followers starting from that point the complete remainder of the server's log. Um, after that last point at which they were equal. Any questions? All right. Um, and just to re repeat a uh, discussion we've had before and we'll probably have again, you notice that we erased some log entries here, which are now so erased that I forget what they were. Um, four and five, so there were some um, well, actually, there was mostly, remember, we erased this log entry here. This used to say four on, on server two. The question is, why was it okay for the system to forget about this client command, right? This thing we erased um, corresponds to some client command, which we're now throwing away. We talked about this yesterday. What's the rationale here? Yeah, so it's not a majority of the servers and therefore whatever previous leader it was who sent this out couldn't have gotten acknowledgments from a majority of servers. Therefore that previous leader couldn't have decided it was committed, couldn't have executed it and applied it to the application state, could never have sent a positive reply back to the client. Um, so because this isn't on a majority of the servers, we know that the client who sent it in has no reason to believe it was executed, couldn't have gotten a reply because one of the rules is the server only sends a, the leader only sends a reply to a client after it commits and executes. Um, so the client had no reason to believe that it was even received by any server. Um, and then, and the rules of figure two basically say the client, if it gets no response after a while, it's supposed to resend the request. So we know whatever request this was that we threw away, um, it was never executed, never included in any state already, and the client's gonna resend it by and by. Yes? Well, it's always deleting a suffix of the follower's log. I mean, in, in the end, the, the, the sort of backup answer to this is that the leader has a complete log. So all else fails, it can just send its complete log to the follower. And indeed, if, you know, if you've just started up the system and something very strange happened, even at the very beginning, then you may end up actually, you know, maybe in some of the tests for <laughs> Lab two, you may end up backing up to the very first entry and then having the leader essentially send the whole log. But because the leader has its whole log, we know it could sort of, it's got all the information that's required to fill everybody's logs up if it needs to. Okay. Um, all right, so in this example, which I guess I now erased, um, we elected, S3 is the leader. Um, 
And so the question is, um, could we, you know, who can we, who are we allowed to elect as leader? Right, can, you know, the, or if you read the paper, you know the answer is, is not just anyone. Um, it turns out it matters a lot for the correctness, the correctness of the system, that um, we don't allow just anyone to be the leader. Like, for example, the first node whose timer goes off may, in fact, not be um, an acceptable leader. And so it turns out Raft has some rules that applies about, oh, yes, um, you can be leader or you can't be leader. Um, and to see why this is true, let's sort of set up a straw man uh, a proposal that um, maybe Raft should accept, should use the server with the longest log as the leader, right? You know, some alternate universe, that could be true. And it is actually true in, in systems with different designs, just not in Raft. So um, the question we're investigating is um, why not use the server with the longest log uh, as leader. And this would involve changing the voting rules in Raft to um, have the voters only vote for nodes that have longer logs. Um, all right, so the example that's going to be convenient for showing why this is a bad idea. So let's imagine we have three, three servers again. Um, and now the log set, setups are. Uh, Server one has entries for terms five, six, and seven. Uh, server two for five and eight. And server three also for five and eight. Um, so the first question, of course, to avoid spending our time scratching our heads about utter nonsense, um, is to make sure that, convince ourselves that this configuration could actually arise. Because if it couldn't possibly arise, then um, maybe a waste of time to figure out what would happen if it did arise. So uh, anybody want to uh, propose a sequence of events whereby this set of logs could have arisen? How about an argument that it couldn't have arisen? <laughs> Oh yeah, okay, so we'll, uh, maybe we'll back up some time. Um, all right, so server one wins, is, wins the election at this point, yeah. and it's in term six. Yeah, and then uh, it adds entries Sends out, yeah, it receives a client request, sends out the first append entries, and then. And, uh, <laughs> oh. No, that's fine, actually, everything's fine so far, nothing's wrong. All right, well, a, a good bet for all these things is then it crashes, right? Or it receives the client request in term six. It appends the client request to its own log, which it does first. And it's about to send out append entries, but it crashes. OK, so it didn't send out any append entries. And then, you know, we need, then it crashes and restarts very quickly. There's a new election. And gosh, server one is elected again as the, as the new leader. It receives, in term seven, it receives a client request, appends it to its log. Ah. Oh, and then it crashes, right? Um, and then after, uh, after it crashes, we have a new election. Maybe server two gets elected this time. Um, or maybe server one is down now, so off the table. If server two is elected at this point, suppose server one is, is <clears throat> still dead, what term is server, one, server two going to use? Yeah, eight's the right answer. So why eight and not? Remember, this, you know, this is now gone. Why eight and not six? Because they already voted for server one. That's absolutely right. So not written on the board, but in order for server one to have been elected here, it must have votes from a majority of nodes, which include at least one of server two <clears throat> and server three. If you look at the vote request uh, code in figure two, if you vote for somebody, you're, you're supposed to record the term in persistent storage. Um, and that means that either server two or server three are both new about term six and, in fact, term seven. Um, and therefore, when server one dies and they can elect a new leader, at least one of them knows that the current term was eight. Um, if that one, um, and only that one, actually, if there's only one of them, only that one could win an election because um, it has the higher term number. If they both know about term eight, sorry, if they both know about term seven, then they'll both, then either one of them will try to be leader in term eight. Um, 
So the fact of, that the next term must be term eight is, is ensured by the property that the majorities must overlap and the fact that um, the current term is updated by vote request and is persistent and guaranteed not to be lost even if there were some crashes here. So the next term is going to be eight. Server two or server three will win the leadership election. Um, and let's just imagine that whichever one it is sends out uh, append entries for a new client request. The other one gets it. And so now we have this configuration. All right. So that was a bit of a detour. We're back to our um, original question of in this configuration, suppose server one revives. We have an election. Um, would it be okay to use server one? Would it be okay to have the rule be uh, the longest log wins? The longest log gets to be the, the leader. Yeah, obviously not, right? Because if server one was a leader, um, it, um, it's gonna force its log onto the two followers by the append entries machinery that we just talked about a few minutes ago. So if we allow server one to be the leader, um, it's gonna you know, send out append entries, whatever, back up, overwrite these eights, tell the followers to erase their log entries for term eight, to accept, to overwrite them with this six and seven log entries, and then to proceed now with ide logs identical to server ones. Um, so of course, why are we upset about this? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, eight was already committed. Right, it's on a majority of, of servers. It's already committed, um, probably uh, executed, quite possibly a re reply sent to a client. So we're not entitled to delete it. Um, and therefore, server one um, cannot be allowed to become leader and force its log onto servers two and three. Um, everybody see why that's a bad idea for Raft? Um, and because of that, this can't possibly have been the uh, uh, rule for elections. Um, uh, of course, shortest log doesn't work too well either. <laughs> um, and so in fact, if you read forward to um, section something, 5.4.1, uh, uh, Raft actually has a slightly more sophisticated election restriction that that the request vote handling, RPC handling code is supposed to check before it says yes, before it votes a yes for a different peer. And the rule is um, we, we only vote, um, we vote yes for some candidate who send us a re, um, request votes only if um, candidate has a higher term in the last log entry, or same last term, same term in the last log entry, um, and uh, a log length that's greater than or equal to the, uh, uh, the, the server that's Receive, that received the vote request. And so if we apply this here, if server two gets a uh, vote request from server one, um, their last log entry terms are seven. And so the uh, server one's gonna send out a request votes with a last uh, entry term, whatever, of seven. Server two's is eight. So this isn't true. Um, Server, server three didn't get a request from somebody with a higher term in the last entry. Um, and well, the last entry terms aren't the same either, so the second clause doesn't apply either. Um, so neither server two new serv nor server three is gonna vote for server one. And so even if it sends out its vote request first, because it has a shorter election timeout, nobody's gonna vote for it except itself. So it only gets one vote, it's not a majority. If either server two or server three um, becomes a candidate, then either of them will accept the other because they have the same last term number and their logs are each greater than or equal to in length than the others. So either of them will vote for, for the other one. Um, will server one vote for either of them? 
Yes, because either server two or server three has a higher trim number in the last entry. Um, and so you know, what this is doing is making sure that you can only become a candidate if, um, or it prefers candidates that knew about higher, that had log entries from higher terms. That is, it prefers candidates that are more likely to have been receiving log entries from the previous leader. Um, and you know, this second part says, well, if we were all listening to the previous leader, then we're gonna prefer the uh, server that has saw more requests from the very last leader. Any questions about the election restriction? Okay. Um, a f um, final thing about sending out log entries is that this rollback scheme, um, at least as I described it, and it's as, as it's described in figure two, rolls back one log entry at a time. Um, and, you know, probably a lot of time that's okay, but there are situations maybe in the real world and definitely in the lab tests where um, backing up one entry at a time is gonna take a long, long time. And so the real world situation where that might be true is if a, um, if a follower has been down for a long time and missed a lot of append entries and the leader restarts and if you follow the pseudocode in figure two, if a leader restarts, it's supposed to set its next index to the end of the leader's log. So if the follower has been down and you know, missed the last thousand log entries and the leader reboots, the leader is gonna have to walk back all one at a time, one RPC at a time, all thousand of those log entries that the follower missed. Um, and there's no you know, particular reason why this would never happen in real life. It could easily happen. Um, a somewhat more contrived situation um, that the tester definitely explores is if a follower is, if we say we have five servers and there's, um, there's a leader, but the leader got trapped with one follower in a network partition, but the leader doesn't know it's not leader anymore and it's still sending out append entries to its one follower, none of which are committed, um, while in the other majority partition, the system is continuing as usual the ex leader and follower in that um, minority partition could end up putting in their logs, you know, sort of unlimited numbers of uh, log entries for a stale term that will never be committed and need to be deleted and overwritten eventually when they rejoin the main group. Um, that's maybe a little less likely in the real world, but uh, you'll see it happen um, in the test setup. So in order to be able to back up faster, the paper has a, um, somewhat a vague description of a faster scheme um, uh, towards the end of section 5.3. Um, it's a little bit hard to interpret, so I'm gonna try to um, explain what their idea is about how to back up faster a little bit better. And the, the general idea is to be able to, to have the follower send enough information to the leader that the leader can jump back an entire term's worth of entries that have to be deleted um, per append entry. So it, leader may only have to send one and an append and append entries per term in which the leader and follower disagree um, instead of one per entry. Um, and so there's three cases I think are important. Um, the fact is though you can probably think of many different uh, log backup acceleration strategies. And um, here's one. Um, so I'm gonna divide the kinds of situations you might see into three cases. So this is fast backup. Case one, um, and I'm just gonna talk about one follower and the leader and not worry about the, um, the other nodes. Let's say we have server one, which is the follower, um, and server two, which is the new leader. So this is one case, and here, um, we need to back up over a, a term where that term's entirely missing from the leader. Another case. So in this case, um, we need to back up over some entries, but they're entries for a term that the leader actually knows about. Um, so apparently the, uh, this follower saw a couple of entries, a couple of, uh, 
the very last few append entries sent out by a leader that was about to crash. Uh, but the new leader didn't see them. We still need to back up over them. Um, and a third case is where the follower is entirely missing. Um, the follower and the leader agree, but uh, the follower is just missing the end of the leader's log. Um, and um, I believe you can take care of all three of these with um, three pieces of extra information in the reply that a follower sends back to the leader. Um, in the case, in the append entries, so we're talking about the append entries reply. Um, if the follower rejects the append entries because the logs don't agree, um, there's three pieces of information that'll be useful in taking care of these three cases. I'll call them X term. Um, which is the term of the conflicting entry. Right? Remember the leader sent this uh, previous log term, um, and uh, if the follower rejects it because it has something there but the term's wrong, so um, it'll put the, the follower's term for the conflicting entry here. Or, you know, negative one or something if it actually doesn't have anything in the log there. Um, It'll also send back um, the index of the conflicting, whoops, the index of the first entry with that term. Um, and finally, if there wasn't any uh, log entry there at all, the follower will send back um, the length of its log, length of the follower's log. So for case one, the way this helps, um, um, if, the, uh, if the leader sees that the leader doesn't even have an entry with x term, of term x term at all in its log, um, so that's this case where the leader didn't have term five in it. The leader can simply back up to the beginning um, of the follower's run of entries with x term. That is, the, the uh, leader can set its next index to this x index thing, which is the first entry of um, the follower's run of uh, items from term five. All right, so if, uh, if the leader doesn't have x term at all, it should back up to x back the follower up to x index. The second case, you can detect, the, the leader can detect um, if x term is valid, and the leader actually has some um, um, log entries of term x term. And that's the case here, where uh, the, um, you know, the disagreement is here, but the, the leader actually has some entries of that term. And in that case, the leader should back up to the last entry it has that um, has the, has the follower's term for the conflicting term in it. That is the last entry the leader has for term four in this case. Um, and if neither of these two cases hold, that is the, um, well, I, actually if the uh, follower indicates by maybe setting x term to minus one that it actually didn't have anything whatsoever at the conflicting log and index because its log is too short, then the um, uh, leader should back up its next index to the last entry that the follower had at all and start sending from there. Um, and I'm telling you this because it'll be useful for doing the lab. Um, and if, if you m miss some of my description, it's, it's in the lecture notes. And any questions about this backing up business? Yeah? Uh, the reason binary search wouldn't be the first entry. Do you still want to find the first entry where the term and the index are the same? I think that's true, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe binary search. Uh, I'm not ruling out other solutions. I mean, that, you know, after reading the paper's non-description of how to do it, I, like, cooked this up. And there's probably uh, other ways of doing it. There's probably better ways, of, faster ways of doing it. Like, I'm, I'm sure that if you were willing to send back more information or have a more sophisticated strategy like binary search, you could do a better job. But you, you almost certainly need to do something. Um, experience suggests that in order to pass the tests, 
you'll need to do something to, to well, probably not. I mean, although I, 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 uh, that, that's not quite true. Like one of the solutions I've written over the years actually does the stupid thing and still passes the tests. Um, but because the tests, you know, the one of the uh, sort of unfortunate but inevitable things about the tests we give you is that they have a bit of a real time requirement. That is, the tests are not willing to wait forever for your solution to produce an answer. Um, so it is possible to have a solution that's you know, technically correct, um, but takes so long that the tester gives up. And unfortunately, you know, we will, the tester will fail you if your solution doesn't finish the test in whatever the time limit is. And therefore, you do actually have to pay some attention to performance in order, to, you know, your solution has to be both correct and have enough performance to finish before the tester gets bored and, and times out on you, which is like, 10 minutes, or I don't know what it is. Um, and unfortunately, it's relatively, like this stuff's complex enough that it's not that hard to write a correct solution that's not fast enough. Um, yes? Can you reiterate the difference between case one and case two? So um, the way you can tell, the leader can tell the difference is that um, the follower is supposed to send back the term number it sees in the conflicting entry. You, we have case one if the leader does not have that term in its log. So here, the follower will set x term to five, to five because this is, this, is going to be the, this is going to be the conflicting entry. Um, the follower sets its x term to five. The leader observes, oh, I do not have term five in my log, and therefore, this is case one. And it, you know, it should back up to the beginning. Like it doesn't, the follower has, the leader has none of those entry, term five entries, so it should just get rid of all of them in the follower by backing up to the beginning, which is x index. Do you have a question? Just, just to confirm that the follower is term five, just the leader, just the leader didn't have it, so it's disregarded. Yeah, yeah, because the, the leader's gonna back up its next index to here, and then send an append entries that starts here, and the rules of figure two say oh, the follower just has to replace its log, so it is going to get rid of the fives. Okay. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is persistence. Um, you'll notice in figure two that the state in the upper left-hand corner is sort of divided into you know, some are marked persistent, and some are marked volatile. Um, and what's going on here is that the, um, the distinction between persistence and volatile you know, only matters if a server uh, reboots, crashes, and restarts. Right? Because the persistent, what the persistent means is that if you change one of those items that's marked persistent, you're supposed to, um, the server's supposed to write it to disk or to some other non-volatile storage, like SSD or battery backed something or whatever. Um, that will ensure that if the server restarts, that it will be able to find that information and sort of reload it into memory. Um, and that's to allow, you know, that's to allow servers to be able to pick up where they left off if they crash and restart. Now, um, um, you might think that it would, it would be sufficient and simpler to say, well, if a, if a server crashes, then we just throw it away, and um, or, or you know, we need to be able to throw it away and replace it with a brand new empty server and bring it up to speed, right? And of course, you do actually, it is vital to be able to do that, right? Because if some server suffers a failure, some catastrophic failure, like it's, you know, disk melts or something, um, you absolutely need to be able to replace it and you cannot count on getting anything useful off its disk if something bad happened to its disk. So we absolutely need to be able to replace, to completely replace servers um, that have no state whatsoever. Um, you might think that's sufficient to handle any difficulties, but it's actually not. It, it turns out that another common failure mode is power failure um, of you know, the entire cluster where they all stop executing at the same time, right? And in that case, we can't handle, or we can't handle that failure by simply throwing away the servers and replacing them with new hardware that we buy from Dell. Um, we actually have to be able to 
get off the ground. We, we need to be able to get a copy of the state back in order to keep executing if we, if we want our service to be fault tolerant. And therefore, in order, at least in order to handle the situation of simultaneous power failure, we have to have a way for the servers to sort of save their state somewhere where it will be available um, when the power returns. Um, and that's one way of viewing what's going on with persistence. Um, it's that this, that's the state that's required uh, to get a server going again um, after either a single power failure or power failure of the entire cluster. Um, all right, so figure two lists um, three items, only three items are persistent. So, um, there's a log, that's like all the log entries, uh, current term, and voted for. Um, and by the way, you know, when a, a server reboots, it actually has to make an explicit check to make sure that these data are valid on its disk um, before it rejoins the RAF cluster. It has to have some way of saying, oh yeah, I actually do have some saved persistent state as opposed to a bunch of zeros that, um, that are not valid. Um, all right, so the reason why log has to be persisted um, is that at least according to figure two, this is the only record of the application state. That is, figure two doesn't really have a notion. Figure two does not say that we have to persist the application state. So if we're running a database or you know, a test and set service like for VMware FT, the actual database or the actual value of the test and set flag isn't persisted according to figure two. Only the log is. And so when the server restarts, the only information available to reconstruct the application state is the sequence of commands in the log. Um, and so that has to be persisted. Um, and so what about current term? Why does current term have to be persisted? Yeah, so they're both about ensuring that there's only one, that each term has at most one leader. Um, so yeah, so voted for the specific uh, you know, potential damaging case is that if a server receives a vote request and votes for server one, and then it crashes, and if it didn't persist this, the identity of who it voted for, then it might crash, restart, get another vote request for the same term from server two, and say, gosh, I haven't voted for anybody because my voted for is blank, now I'm gonna vote for for server two, and now our server is voted for server one and for server two in the same term. Um, and that might allow two servers, since both server one and server two voted for themselves, uh, they both may think they have a majority out of three and they're both gonna become leader. Now we have two simultaneous servers for the same term. So this, that's why voted for has to be persistent. Um, current term is gonna be a little more subtle, but um, we actually talked before about how um, you know, again, we don't wanna have more than one server for a term, and if we don't know what term number it is, then um, we can't necessarily, we, then it may be hard to ensure that there's only one server for a term. And I think um, maybe in this example, yeah, if, S, if server one was down and server two and server three were gonna try to elect a new server, um, they need evidence that the correct term number is eight and not six. Right, because if they, if they forgot about current term and it was just server two and server three voting for each other and they only had their log to look at, they might think the next term should be term six. If they did that, they'd start producing stuff for term six, but now there's gonna be a lot of confusion because we have two different term sixes. Um, and so that's the reason why current term uh, has to be persistent to preserve evidence about uh, term numbers that have already been used. Um, these have to be uh, persisted pretty much every time you change them, right? Um, so certainly uh, the safe thing to do is every time you add an entry to the log or change current term or, uh, or set voted for, you need to, um, you probably need to persist that. 
And in a real RAF server, that would mean writing it to the disk. So you'd have some set of files that recorded this stuff. Um, you can probably be a little bit, uh, you maybe can cut some corners if you observe that um, you don't need to persist these things until you communicate with the outside world. So there may be some opportunity for a little bit of batching by saying, well, we don't have to persist anything until we're about to reply to an RPC or about to send out an RPC. Um, and that may allow you to avoid a few persistings. Um, the reason that's important is that uh, writing stuff to disk is, um, can be very expensive. It's a, if it's a mechanical hard drive that we're talking about, then writing anything um, you know, if the way we're persisting is writing files on the disk, writing anything on the disk costs you about 10 milliseconds because you either have to wait for the disk to spin, uh, for the point you want to write to spin under the head, which the disk only rotates about once every 10 milliseconds, or worse yet, you may actually have to seek to move the arm to the right track. Right? So these persistings can be terribly, terribly expensive. And if for sort of any kind of straightforward design, they're likely to be the limiting factor in performance um, because they mean that doing anything, anything whatsoever um, on these RAF servers takes 10 milliseconds a pop. Um, and 10 milliseconds is far longer than it takes to say send an RPC or almost anything else you might do. Um, so yeah, 10 milliseconds each means you can just never, if you persist data to a, mechanical drive, you just can never build a RAF service that can serve more than 100 requests per second, um, because that's what you get at, at 10 milliseconds per operation. Um, and you know, this is, this cost, so this is really uh, all about cost of synchronous um, disk updates. Um, and it comes up in many systems, like file systems. The file systems that are running on your laptops are, the, the designers spend a huge amount of time sort of trying to navigate around the performance problems of synchronous disk, update, synchronous disk writes because in order for stuff to get safe on your disk, in order to update the file system on your laptop's disk safely, um, uh, it turns out the file system has to like be careful about how it writes um, and needs to sometimes wait for the disk to, to finish writing. So this is a like a, cross-cutting issue in all kinds of systems. It certainly comes up in Raft. Um, if you wanted to build a system that could serve more than 100 requests per second, um, then the, uh, there's a bunch of options. One is you can use a solid state drive or some kind of flash or something. Solid state drives can do a write to the flash memory in uh, maybe a tenth of a millisecond, so that's a factor of 100 for you. Um, or if you're even more sophisticated, maybe you can build yourself battery-backed DRAM um, and do the persistence into battery-backed DRAM. And then if the server reboots, hope that the uh, reboot was, took shorter than the amount of time the battery lasts and that the stuff you persisted is still in the RAM. And the, re the reason, I mean, if you have money and sophistication, the reason to favor that is you can write DRAM, you know, millions of times per second. And so it's probably not going to be a performance bottleneck. Anyway, so that, this, this problem is why and, um, the sort of marking a persistent versus volatile in figure two is like has a lot of significance for performance as well as crash recovery and correctness. Any questions about persisting? Yeah. Yes. So if you do a log update, then or like do something, send out an RPC, then immediately crash, then maybe the files... Okay. So your question is basically, you're writing code, say Go code, for your Raft implementation, or you're trying to write a real Raft Im implementation, and you actually want to make sure that when you persist your uh, an update to the log or the current term or whatever, that it, in fact, will be there after a crash and reboot. Like, what's the recipe for what you have to do? to make sure it's there. And your observation that if you call you know, on a Unix or Linux or whatever Mac, if you call write, you know, the write system call is how you write to a disk file. If you simply call write, it, as you pointed out, it is not the case that after the write returns, the data is safe on disk and will, will survive a reboot. It almost certainly isn't, um, almost certainly not on disk. So the, you know, the 
particular piece of magic you need to do is on Unix at any rate. You need, you know, you do need to call write. So you're gonna, you know, write the, you have some file you've opened that's gonna contain the stuff that you wanna write. Um, and then you gotta call this fsync call, which on most systems, the guarantee is that fsync doesn't return until um, all the data you've previously written to this file is safely on the surface, on the media, in a, in a, place, on, in a place where it will still be there if there's a crash and reboot. So, so this thing is, I mean, and then this call is an expensive call, and that's why it's a separate, that's why write doesn't write the disk, and only fsync does is because it's so expensive you would never want to do it unless you really wanted to persist some, stuff, some data. Um, okay, so you can use more expensive disk hardware. The other trick people play a lot is to try to batch. Um, that is, if you can, if client requests are, if you have a lot of client requests coming in, maybe you should accept a lot of them and not reply to any of them for a little bit. Wait till a lot of them accumulate and then persist, you know, 100 log entries at a time um, from your 100 clients and, you know, only then send out the append entries. Because um, you do actually have to persist this stuff to disk. If you receive a client request, you have to persist the new entry to disk before you send the append entries RPCs to the followers. Because um, you're not allowed, if the leader, you know, the leader is essentially um, promising to commit that, uh, that request and can't forget about it. And indeed, the followers have to persist the new log entry to their disk before they reply to the append entries, because their reply to the append entries is also a promise to preserve and eventually commit that log entry. So they can't be allowed to forget about it if they crash. Other questions about persistence? All right, um, well, a final you know, little detail about persistence is that uh, um, some of the stuff in figure two is not persistent. And so it's worth scratching your head a little bit about why commit index, last apply, next index, and match index, why it's fair game for them to be simply thrown away if the server crashes and restarts. Like why wasn't, you know, commit index or last applied? Like, geez, last applied is the record of how much we've executed, right? If we throw that away, aren't we gonna execute log entries twice? And is that correct? How about that? Why is, why is it safe to throw away last applied? Yes. So you just re-execute them. So it wouldn't affect safety, but it would affect performance or availability. Oh, yeah. We're all about simplicity and safety here with Raft. So that's exactly correct. The, um, the reason why all that other stuff can be non-volatile, as you mentioned, I mean, sorry, volatile, the reason why those other fields can be volatile and thrown away is that we can, the leader can reconstruct sort of what's been committed by inspecting its own log and by the results of append entries that it sends out to the followers. I mean, initially the leader, if, it re if everybody restarts because they experience a power failure, initially the leader does not know what's committed, what's executed. Um, but when it sends out log and append entries, it'll sort of gather back information essentially from the followers about what's in, how much of their logs match the leaders and therefore how much must have been committed before the crash. Um, another thing in the figure two world, which is not the real world, Another thing about figure two is that figure two assumes that the application state is destroyed and thrown away if there's a crash and a restart. So the figure two world assumes that while log is persistent, that the application state is absolutely not persistent, required not to be persistent in figure two because um, the, in figure two, the log is preserved, persisted from the very beginning of the system. Um, and so what's gonna happen if you sort of play out what the various rules in figure two after a leader restarts is that the leader will eventually re-execute every single log entry that is handed to the application, you know, starting with log entry one. After a reboot, it's the raft is gonna hand the application every log entry starting from one. And so that will, after a restart, the application will completely reconstruct its state from scratch by a replay from the beginning of the time of the entire log after each restart. Um, and again, that's like a sort of straightforward, elegant plan, but obviously 
potentially um, very slow. Um, which brings us to the next topic, which is log compaction and, uh, and snapshots. Um, and this has a lot to do with uh, Lab 3B, actually. You'll see log compaction and snapshots in Log 3B, in Lab 3B. Um, and so the problem that log compaction and snapshotting is, is uh, solving at Raft is that, indeed, for a long-running system that's been going for weeks or months or years, if we just follow the figure two rules, the log just keeps on growing. It may end up you know, millions and millions of entries long, and so it requires a lot of memory to store. Um, if you store it on disk, like if you have to persist it, every time you persist the log, it's using up a huge amount of space on disk. And if a server ever restarts, it has to reconstruct its state by replaying these millions and millions of log entries from the very beginning, which could take like hours for a server to run through its entire log and re-execute it if it crashes and restarts, all of which is like at some level kind of wasted because before it crashed, it had already had application state. Um, and so, um, in order to cope with this, uh, Raft has this idea of snapshots. And the sort of idea behind snapshots is to be able to save or ask the application to save a copy of its state as of a particular log entry. So we've been mostly kind of ignoring the application, but the fact is that, um, you know, if we have a, you know, supposing we're building a key value store out of Raft, you know, the log is gonna contain a bunch of, you know, put and get sort of read and write requests. So maybe a log contains, you know, a put that some client wants to set x to one, and then another one where it sets x to two, and then, you know, y equals seven or whatever. And, if there's no crashes, as the raft is executing along, there's gonna be this, at the layer above raft, there's gonna be this application, and the application, if it's a key value store database, is, it's gonna be maintaining this table, and as raft hands it um, one command after the next, um, the application's gonna update its table. So, you know, after the first command, it's gonna set x to one in its table. After the second command, it's gonna update its table, you know. Um, one interesting fact is that for most applications, the application state is likely to be much smaller than the corresponding log, right? At some level, we know that the, the, you know, the log and the state are, the log and the, and the state as of some point in the log are kind of uh, interchangeable, right? They both sort of imply the same thing about the state of the application. But um, the log may contain a lot of you know, a lot of multiple assignments to X that use up a lot of space in the log, but are all sort of effectively compacted down to a single entry in the table. And that's pretty typical of these uh, replicated applications. But the point is that um, instead of storing the log, which may grow to be huge, we have the option of storing instead the table, which might be a lot smaller. Um, and that's what the snapshots are doing. So um, when Raft feels that its log has gotten to be too large, you know, more than a megabyte or 10 megabytes or whatever, some arbitrary limit, Raft will ask the application to take, make a snapshot of it, the application state as of a certain point in the log. So if, we, if Raft asked the application for a snapshot, Raft would, set, Raft would pick a point in the log that the snapshot referred to and require the application to produce a snapshot as of that point. This is extremely critical because the, um, because what we're about to do is throw away everything before that point. So if there's not a well-defined point that corresponds to a snapshot, then we can't safely throw away the log before that point. So that means that um, uh, RAF is gonna you know, ask for a snapshot, and the snapshot's basically just the table, right? It's just a, sort of a database server. Um, and we also need to annotate the snapshot with the uh, entry number that it corresponds to. So if basically, you know, if the entries are one, two, three, this snapshot corresponds to uh, just after log index three. With the snapshot in hand, um, if we persist it to disk, Raft persists it to disk, Raft never again will need this part of the log. Um, and it can simply throw it away as long as it persists a snapshot as of a certain inde log index plus the log after that index. As long as that's persisted to disk, we're never gonna need the log before that. Um, and so this is what Raft does. It, it 
Rask asks the application for snapshot, gets a snapshot, saves it to disk with the log after that, and just throws away this log here, right? And so it really operates, or the sort of persistent story is all about pairs of a snapshot and the log after that, after the point in the log associated with the snapshot. Everyone see this? Yes. But does it treat this new log as if it's like a new, like, completely new log? No, it's still, it's, it's, you know, there's these sort of phantom entries one, two, three, and this, you know, suffix of the log is indeed viewed as still the, it's, maybe the right way to think of it is still there's just one log, except these entries are sort of phantom entries that we, that we can view as being kind of there in principle, but since we're, we never need to look at them because we have the snapshot. The fact that they just happen not to be stored anywhere is neither here nor there. But, it's, but yeah, you should think of it as being still the same log, just not just threw away the early entries. Um, th this, uh, that's a maybe a little bit too glib of an answer because the fact is that figure two talks about the log in ways that makes it that if you just follow figure two, you sometimes still need these earlier entries. And so you'll have to reinterpret figure two a little bit in light of the fact that sometimes it says blah, 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 log entry where the log entry doesn't exist. Okay. Um. Okay. And so what happens on a restart, so the restart story is a little more complicated than it, than it used to be with just a log. Um, what happens on a restart is that there needs to be a way for Raft to um, give the latest, for Raft to find the latest snapshot log pair on its disk um, and hand the snapshot to the application. Because we no longer are able to replay you know, all the log entries, so there must be some other way to initialize the application. And basically, not only does the application have to be able to produce a snapshot of application state, but, but it has to be able to absorb a previously made snapshot and sort of reconstruct its table in memory from a snapshot. And so the snap, even though Raft is kind of managing this whole snapshotting stuff, the snapshot contents are really the property of the application. And Raft doesn't really understand what's in here, only the application does, because it's all full of application-specific information. Um, so after a restart, the application has to be able to absorb uh, the latest snapshot that Raft found. Um, so if it were just this simple, it would be simple. Um, unfortunately, this snapshotting, and in particular, the idea that the leader might throw away part of its log, introduces a major piece of complexity. And that is that if there's some follower out there whose log ends before the point at which um, the leader's log starts, then unless we invent something new, namely install snapshot, um, unless we invent something new, that follower can never get up to date, right? Because um, if the followers, you know, if there's some follower whose, whose log only is the first two log entries, we no longer have the log entry three that's required to send it to that follower in an append entries RPC to allow its log to catch up to the, um, the leaders. Um, now, we could avoid this problem by having the leader never drop part of its log if there's any follower out there that hasn't caught up um, to the point at which the leader is thinking about doing a snapshot. Because right? the leader knows through next index, well, actually the leader doesn't really know, but the leader could know in principle um, how far each follower had gotten, and the leader could say, well, I'm just never gonna drop the part of my log before the end of the follower with the shortest log. Um, and that would be okay. It might actually just be a good idea, period. Um, the reason why that's maybe not such a great idea is that, of course, if a follower is shut down for a week, you know, it's, it's not gonna be acknowledging log entries, and that means that the uh, leader can't reduce its memory use by snapshotting. So the way the raft design is chosen to go is that um, the leader is uh, allowed to throw away parts of its logs that would be needed by some follower. And so we need some other scheme than append entries to deal 
um, with the gap between the end of some follower's log and the beginning of the leader's log. And so that uh, solution is the install snapshot RPC. Um, and the deal is that um, when a leader, you know, we have some follower whose log has that, you know, just powered on, its log is short, um, the leader's gonna send it in append entries and you know, it's gonna be forced, the leader's gonna be forced to back up and at some point the leader, you know, failure, failed append entries calls will cause the leader to realize that it's reached the beginning of the actual log it stores. And at that point, instead of sending an append entries, the leader will send its current snapshot plus current log, well, send its current snapshot to the follower and then presumably immediately uh, follow it with uh, an append entries that has the leader's current log. Um, questions? Yeah, and, and the sad truth is, is like this is adds significant complexity to your to your lab three, um, partially because of the kind of cooperation that's required between RAF. This is sort of a a little bit of a violation of modularity that requires a good deal of cooperation. Like, for example, when an install snapshot comes in, it's delivered to RAF, but RAF really requires the application to absorb the snapshot. Um, so they have to talk to each other more than they otherwise might. Yes. Is the way that you snapshot dependent on the application? Oh, yes. So the question is, is, this, is the way the snapshot is created dependent on the application. It absolutely is. So the snapshot creation function is part of the application. It's part of like the key value server. So RAFs will you know, somehow call up to the application and say, geez, you know, I'd really like a snapshot right now. And the application, because only the application understands what its state is. Um, and you know, the, the inverse function by which an application reconstructs its state from a snapshot file is also totally application dependent. Um, but there's intertwining because, of course, every snapshot has to be labeled with a point in a log that it corresponds to. Um, the paper mentions that uh, a follower might receive an install snapshot RPC, even if it's actually currently more up to date than the snapshot. Maybe by mistake. You're talking about rule six and figure 13? Okay, so, yeah, the, the, the question here is that, um, and you will be faced with this in lab three, that um, because the RPC system isn't perfectly reliable and perfectly sequenced, and RPCs can arrive out of order or not at all, or you may send an RPC and get no response and think it was lost, but actually it was delivered and it was the reply that was lost. All these things happen, including to uh, send to whatever, install snapshot RPCs, and the leader's almost certainly sending out many RPCs concurrently, you know, both append entries and install snapshots. That means that you can get things like install snapshot RPCs from deep in the past, um, or almost anything else, right? That, um, and therefore the, the follower has to be careful, um, you know, has to think carefully about an install snapshot that arrives, and the, um, and I think the specific thing you're asking is that if a follower receives a, an install snapshot that appears to be completely redundant, that is, the install snapshot contains information that's older than the information the follower already has, what should the follower do? And rule six in figure 13 says something, but I think an equally valid response to that is that the follower can ignore a snapshot that clearly um, is from the past. I don't really understand that rule six. Okay, um, I want to move on to uh, sort of um, some more conceptual topic for a bit. Um, so far, we haven't really tried to nail down uh, anything about what it meant to be correct, what it meant for a, um, uh, replicated service or any, any other kind of service uh, to be behaving correctly. And the reason why, and often, you know, whatever, for most of my life I managed to get by without 
worrying too much about precise definitions of correctness. But the fact is that you know, if you're trying to optimize something or you're trying to think through some weird corner case, it's often handy to actually have a more or less formal way of deciding is that behavior correct or not correct. And so you know, for here, what we're talking about is you know, clients are sending in requests to, the, to our replicated service with RPC. Maybe they're resending. Who knows what? Maybe the service is crashing and restarting and you know, loading snapshots or whatever. If a client sends in a request and gets a response like, is that response correct? How are we supposed to, how are we supposed to tell whether response A would be correct or response B? Um, so we need a notion. We need a pretty formal notion of distinguishing, oh, that's OK from no. That would be a wrong answer. Um, and for this lab, the, our notion of correctness um, is linearizability. Um, and I mentioned strong consistency in some of the papers. I mentioned strong consistency on basically equivalent to linearizability. Um, linearizability is a sort of a formalization of, more or less, of um, the behavior you would expect if there was just one server and it didn't crash and it executed the command client request one at a time and you know nothing funny ever happened. Um, so it has a it has a definition, and the definition. Um, well, I'll write out the definition and then talk about it. So um, so an execution history. is linearizable, linearizable, and this is in the notes, so. Um, if there exists a total order, so an, an execution history is a sequence of client requests, maybe many requests from many clients. Um, if there's some total order uh, of the operations in the history, that matches the real-time order of requests. So if one request, if a client sends out a request and gets a response, and then later in time, another client sends out a request and they get a response, those two requests are ordered because one of them started after the other one finished. So um, it's linearizable. A history is linearizable if there exists an order of the operations in the history um, that matches real-time. for non-concurrent requests, that is for requests that didn't overlap in time. Um, um, and uh, each read, uh, you can think of it as each read sees the value from the most immediately preceding write to the, uh, to the same piece of data. Um, most recent write in the order. All right, this is the definition. Um, let me illustrate what it means by running through an example. Um, so first of all, a history is a, a record of client operations. So this is a definition that you can apply from the outside. This definition doesn't appeal in any way to what happens inside the implementation or how the implementation works. It's something that we can, if we see a system operating and we can watch the messages that come in and out, we can answer the question, was that execution that we observed linearizable? Um, so let me... Uh, Let me write out a history and talk about why it is or isn't linearizable. All right, so here's an example. Um, linearizability talks about operations that start at one point and end at another. And so this corresponds to the time at which a client sends a request um, and then later receives a reply. So, let us suppose that our history says that at, at some particular time, this time, um, some client sent a write request for the data item named X and asked for it to be set to one. Um, and then uh, time passed, and at the second vertical bar is when that client got a reply. So we sent a request at this point, you know, time passed, who knows what's happening, and the client got a reply there. Um, and then later in time, that client or some other client, doesn't really matter, um, sends a write request again for item X, 
the value two and get the response to that write. Um, meanwhile, some client sends a read for x and gets value two and sent the request there and got the response with value two there. And there's another request that we observed that's part of the history. Um, request was sent to read value x and it got value one back. Um, and so when we have a history like this, you know, the question word that you ask about this history is, is this a linearizable history? That is, did the machinery, did the service, did the system that produced this history, you know, was that a linearizable system? Or did it produce a linearizable history in this case? If it, this history is not linearizable, then, um, then at least if we're talking about lab three, we know we have a problem. There must be some, some bug. Okay, so we need to analyze this to figure out if it's linearizable. There's linear, linearizability requires us to produce an order, you know, one by one order of the four operations in that history. So we know we're looking for an order, and there's two constraints on the order. One is, um, if one operation finished before another started, then uh, the one that finished first has to come first in the history. The other is, if some read sees a particular written value, um, then the read must come after the write in the order. Right, so we want to order, so we're going to produce an order that has four entries, the two writes and the two reads. Um, I'm going to draw with arrows the constraints implied by those two rules, and, and our order is going to have to obey these constraints. So one constraint is that this write finished before this write started, and therefore, one of the ordering constraints is that this right must appear in the total order uh, before this right. Um, this read saw the value of two. So in the total order, um, the most recent right, that this read must come after this right, and this right must be the most recent right. So that means that um, in the total order, we must see the right of x to two, and then after it, the read of x it yields two. Um, and um, this, uh, this read of x of one, if we assume that the x didn't already have the value one, there, there must be this relationship, um, and that is the read must come after the right, and this read also must come before this right. And maybe there's some other restrictions too. Anyway. We can take these, we can take this set of arrows and flatten it out into an order, and that actually works. So the order that's, that, dem the total order that demonstrates that this history is linearizable is first the right of x to one, then the read of x yielding one, then the right of x to two, then the read of x that yields two. Right, so the fact that there is this order that does obey the ordering constraints shows that this history is linearizability and um, doesn't, you know, if we're worried about the system that produced this history, whether it's a, whether that system is linearizable, then uh, this particular example we saw doesn't contradict the presumption that the system is linearizable. Any questions about what I just did? Each read sees, uh, you know, read of x, the value it sees must be the uh, value written by the most, re the most recent preceding write in the order. So, you know, in this case, in this case we're totally okay with this order because this read, the value it saw, is indeed the value written by the most recent write in this order. Um, and this read, the value it saw is the value. I mean, in, informally, it's that reads can't real, should not be yielding stale data. If I write something and read it back, gosh, I should see the value I, I wrote. And that's just like a formalization of the notion that. Um, and also, if, if that's, that could be multiple, that's Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let me, let me uh, at least write up a. Um, um, 
example that's not indeed linearizable. So there's example two. Um, let's suppose our history is uh, we had a right of x to value one. Um, the right of x with value two. Um, and so this one, we also want to write out the arrows. And, um, so we know what the constraints are on any total order we might find. Um, the right of x to 1, um, because of time, because it finished in real time before the right to x2 started, it must come before in any um, satisfying order we produce. The right of x to 2 has to come before the right, before the read of x that yields 2. So we have this arrow. Um, the read of x to 2 finished before the read of x to 1 started. So we have this arrow. And the read of x to 1, uh, because it saw value 1, has to come after the right of x to 1, and more crucially, before the right of x to 2. Right? It certainly can't have this read of x yielding 1 if it's immediately preceded by a right of x to 2. So we also have this arrow um, like this. And because there's a cycle in these constraints, there's no order. Um, that can obey all these constraints. And therefore, this history is not linearizable. Um, and so the system that produced it is, uh, is not a linearizable system. You know, it would be linearizable. If the history was missing any one of these three, um, then it would break the cycle. Yes? Uh, maybe. Um, I'm not sure, because suppose, or, or I don't know how to incorporate very strange things, like supposing somebody read 27. You know, it doesn't really, if there's no write of 27, a read of 27, it doesn't, at least the way I've written out the rules doesn't sort of, well, there may be some sort of anti-dependency that you would construct. Okay. Um, I will continue this discussion uh, next week.